Welcome to A Star Witness. Hello everyone, this is Kayla bringing another episode. And before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you be with us and help us to be more like you. There is just so much evil in the world. There is so much that we have to change about ourselves. There is not a lot of time left in this world. The signs and the things that are happening, they show us time and time again that your coming is near. Lord, I ask that you help us to become more like you. Help us to hate sin and to be rid of it all. We thank you and praise you for hearing and answering our prayer. And we ask all these things in your precious Holy Son's name. Amen. All right. So what I want to do is I want to read some quotes that are very, very powerful, very interesting. And then I'll comment as I go. With that, let's get right into it. The first one is from ST, April 13, 1891, paragraph one. It says, Christ prayed for his disciples that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The unity of believers is to be an evidence to the world of the divine power and mission of Christ. This should be the mighty argument to convince the world that Christ is the Son of God, the Redeemer of fallen man. The love existing between believers is to be similar to the love existing between the Father and the Son, and this love in the soul is the evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are to love God supremely and our neighbors as ourselves. It is in the lack of this love that thousands fail and are found transgressors of the law. Supreme love for God will lead to love for our fellow men. And the commandment of Christ is love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. We cannot have this love unless Jesus is abiding in the heart by living faith. The very unity of disciples, the love manifested one for another, will be evidence to the world that God has sent his son into the world as its redeemer. This unity and love will exist wherever the spirit Spirit of the Lord abides. Heart will be bound to heart and works of righteousness will appear in the daily life. This is what we need to do. We need to pray to the Lord to give us this love for others and we need to have that love for God. It is only by loving God that we can have love for others. So we can't do one without the other. We must have this love for the world. Like Christ loves us, like Christ loves everyone. We really need to work on this because it is so important and we will see this time and time again. Again. She says in 10 MR 144.2 and 0.3, why should not believers love one another? It is impossible to love Christ and at the same time act uncourteously toward one another. It is impossible to have the Christ's love in the heart and at the same time draw apart from one another, showing no love or or sympathy. The more love we have for Christ, the more love we will have for one another. There must be a reformation on this point, else there will be in our churches a perilous departing from God. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. 1 John 4, 16 through 21. The Lord is very clear in these verses. He says we need to love others as we love him. And if we have that love in us, it will cast out fear, fear of standing up for truth. It will cast out fear of standing strong in the last days. It will cast out that hatred and malice and selfishness that we have in our hearts. We all have it. We all have those tendencies. We must get this Christ-like love in our hearts like he loved us. We cannot hate anybody and expect to be in heaven. That is just not going to happen. And we are told this time and time again. She says in our age, February 23, 1897, paragraph 1 and 2. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest
manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. See further 1 John 4, 18-21. It is the expression of God's love for us that makes us care for one another. When the Lord Jesus dwells in our hearts, we think the thoughts of God and do the works of God. How can I find language to express the deep, earnest interest I have for our people? I am filled with yearning of soul that those who have accepted present truth should realize that they are to be sanctified through the truth. Otherwise, they lie against the truth. God is the author and finisher of our faith. Notwithstanding our varying types of character, we are brought into church capacity through the profession of our faith. Christ is the head of the church. And if those whose names are on the church record do not belong to Jesus, the invisible head, they are like the fruitless branch of the vine and are taken away. If one is really a fruitful branch, he will make it manifest by bearing fruit, giving evidence of his absolute allegiance to Christ. He will have a spiritual connection with God. Faith and love constitute the gold of character and will be ever working on the Lord's side to unite and harmonize the members of Christ body. So here we are seeing through the verses in the Bible once again and through her own words how important it is to have that connection, to have that love for God and for others. If we don't have that spirit of Christ, if we don't have that love and that faith in us and all of the other fruits of the spirit, we will be as a dead branch cut off in the end. We have to exhibit these wonderful traits of character if we want to be in heaven. Otherwise, we won't be there because because hatred and malice and all of these other evil characters are not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. We need that connection with God. God will help us to have that love, to have that connection with him. We must pray more than ever before. We must have that earnest, deep, longing, abiding want to pray to the Lord and to ask for his help and to seek to change our characters because time is running out, brothers and sisters, and we don't have have long anymore. She says in ST July 2, 1894 paragraph 8, Jesus marked out in a plain way the line of conduct that we all should pursue. We are to love God supremely and our neighbors as ourselves. The question asked by the lawyer is of importance to each one of us and the answer is plain and decided so that no man need walk in darkness because he has the light. The whole duty of man is comprised in keeping the first four and the last six commandments. The spirit that prompts men to reveal in life the love of God will also make a man an obedient member of the heavenly family. If men love worldly things, name, position, wealth, or any object that leads them to forget God, they love that which makes them idolaters. Nothing should be permitted to so hold the affections that God is thrust out of the mind. The second commandment will be easily disobeyed if the first is not kept. Supreme love of God will sanctify the affections and the fruit of love to God will be love to mankind. Those who have been tested and proved on this matter of loving others as themselves will be pronounced meet for an inheritance with the saints in light. They will not become exalted as did Lucifer in the courts of light. They will not create rebellion in heaven because another has a brighter crown than they have. Heaven will be the home of the pure and undefiled and those who reach that home of joy will feel rich, receiving a reward that they do not in the least feel that they deserve. That is very powerful words, very amazing to hear all of these things. We won't even feel worthy of the reward that we do get because in our minds we are unworthy. We should never say, oh, I'm so worthy of this because that's pride. We need to 
break down those barriers. We in and of ourselves are nothing. God is everything. He created us. He loves us. He is making us breathe. He is love supreme and he wants to give us an abundance, overflowing measure of that love. And he says it time and time again. Yet he tells us if we reject his love, there are consequences for those actions. And we must also share that love with the world and tell them that, hey, God loves you, but if you don't love him, here's what's going to happen. And we have to find a way to do that in a kind and loving way and not in a mean-spirited way. It says in YI, January 24, 1901, paragraph 1 through paragraph 4, this, to be a Christian means to possess the attributes of Christ's character, to have a heart imbued with love for God, to delight, to honor God, to reach earnestly after heavenly attainments. It means to render to God grateful songs of praise from a heart swelling with gratitude, to appreciate all that has its origin in God and heaven. The Christian loves what God loves. A heart filled with Christian love is lifted far above the atmosphere of selfishness. It lives in a pure, bright, holy atmosphere. The love that God puts into the heart is a love dictated by holy impulses, sustained by a sense of duty, and cherished by a resolute will. In the soul where this love is cherished, virtue will grow like a tree in a well-cultivated garden. To be a Christian means to possess the Christian graces, to bear fruit unto righteousness, even the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. To be a Christian means to practice religion in the home. Where is it more needed? Home influence, all powerful for good, is such only as it is carefully cherished. It cannot bear the blast of rudeness or neglect without receiving a wound which can with difficulty be healed. The motives and tastes of the Christian are entirely opposite to those of the worldling. It is impossible to be in harmony with Christ and with the world at the same time. But among the people of God, the love of the world has been increasing to an alarming extent. We feel alarmed as we see so many who profess to accept Christ going on from day to day the same as before. Too often believers act in such a way that unbelievers have no cause to think that they are living any nearer Christ than they themselves. Their conversation is flippant. Their actions are unlike Christ. Many who take upon themselves baptismal vows do not live these vows even for one day. They have not come out from the world. They do not know what it means to hold communion with God. We fear that many youth have stopped short of genuine conversion. By their actions, they test Testify that they have no part with Christ, that they are only pretenders. Ye shall know them by their fruits. A genuine change of heart carries its evidence with it. The life of the one who is truly converted is separate and distinct from the life of the worldling. Instead of being absorbed in worldly pleasure, the Christian hungers and thirsts for the bread of life and the water of salvation. He is more anxious to learn the way of the Lord and to secure his favor than to please himself or those who are not not in harmony with God. These words are so amazing to think about and really to contemplate. It is a very serious matter to have all of these Christian graces and to have it in our life and to portray it so that the world, when they look at us and they see and they hear us speak, that they say, that person is different. They talk different. They act differently. What is it about them that makes them so kind in the face of everybody yelling and screaming or having bad attitudes toward them? What is it about them that they are able to have patience and love and peace and goodness? It's like you see them glowing and I want to know what they have so that I can have it in my life too. This is the kind of witnesses that we need to be. We need to stand up for truth in a different way. We need to stand up for Christ in a different way. We need to be firm in our convictions. We need to not sit on the fence half and half, half in the world, half with Christ. It is all or nothing. We must give all to God. We must have a true conversion. We can say we love God all we want, but our actions reveal the truth. So if we love God, it means we will be obeying his commandments in all things. We cannot do both. Even a tiny 
any little sliver of sin is not welcome in heaven. These are serious matters, but we need to tell the world of the love that Christ has, and we need to tell them in a way that they hunger for it just as much as we do. That they say, whatever you have and whatever you are portraying, I want that in my life, because I see in you something that is wonderful and good, and you can tell them that it is Christ living in you, the hope and glory, and not because of anything in you that is good, but because Christ gave you those attributes and those things. And at first, it's really hard. I mean, it is still hard. We will have plenty of opportunities where we will mess up because as soon as we set in our minds that we want to do better and we want to do good, we will be getting tests and trials and tribulation that will come our way, that will make us frustrated, that will make us want to lose our patience, that will make us want to act in a certain way because the devil doesn't want us to bear these fruits. The devil wants us to continue being rude and mean and unkind and all of these things he wants us to continue doing because if we continue acting in that way we will not be saved and he doesn't want us to be saved but that doesn't mean it's impossible we must pray more we must have that connection with God we must go to the Lord more than we do now he is waiting to bless us there are storehouses upon storehouses of blessings waiting if we would only ask and we are told that time and time again and that's a whole other study and subject but it is amazing to know that God God is willing and he is able to send every angel out of heaven if necessary. We just need to ask and he is waiting to help us. In FE 277.1 to 280.1, it says this, there is no form of vice, worldliness, or drunkenness that will do a more baleful work upon the character, embittering the soul, and setting in train evils that overbear good than human passions not under the control of the Spirit of God. Anger getting touched, stirred up, will never pay. How many prodigals are kept out of the kingdom of God by the unlovely character of those who claim to be Christians? Jealousy, envy, pride, and uncharitable feelings, self-righteousness, easily provoked, thinking evil, harshness, cold, unsympathetic. These are the attributes of Satan. Teachers will meet with these things in the students' characters. It is a terrible thing to have these things to deal with. But in seeking to cast out these evils, the worker has in many instances developed similar attributes which have marred the soul of the one with whom he is dealing. There is really no place in heaven for these dispositions. A man with such a character will only make heaven miserable because he himself is miserable. Except ye be born again, said Christ, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. To enter heaven, a man must have Christ formed within. The whole hope of glory and take heaven with him. The Lord Jesus alone can fashion and change the character. For want of patience, kindness, forbearance, unselfishness, and love, the revealings of the traits flash forth involuntarily when off guard, and unchristian words, unchrist likeness of character, burst forth sometimes to the ruin of the soul. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Mark it. The apostle meant where there is a cultivation of genuine love love for precious souls, it will be exhibited for those most in need of that patience which suffereth long and is kind, and will not be ready to magnify a small indiscretion or direct wrong into large unpardonable offenses, and will not make capital of others' misdoings. The love for souls for whom Christ died will not do that which has been done through misconceptions of that which was due to the erring, exposing their errors and weakness before a whole school. How do you think Jesus has looked upon such transgressions? Had he been present, he would have said to those doing these things, ye know not the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the scriptures it is plainly shown how to deal with the erring. Forbearance, kindly consideration, consider thyself lest thou also be tempted, would meet the stubborn, obdurate heart. Love of Jesus will cover a multitude of sins, that they shall not prey upon the offender, neither be exposed to create feelings of every stripe and character in the human breast of those to whom these errors and mistakes are laid open, and in the one thus dealt with. He is too often driven to desperation. His mind is beyond the healing. Now the work is to have the grace of Christ in the soul, which will never, never be guilty of exposing another's wrongs, unless it is a positive necessity. Practice in the line of Christ. The true witness speaks in Revelation 21.5. Practice 
love. There is nothing in Christianity that is capricious. If a man will not exercise his arm, it becomes weak and deficient in muscular strength. Unless the Christian exercises his spiritual powers, he acquires no strength of character, no moral vigor. Love is a very precious plant and must be cultivated if it flourishes. The precious plant of love is to be treated tenderly, practiced, and it will become strong and vigorous and rich in fruit bearing, giving expression to the whole character. A Christ-like nature is not selfish, not unkind, and will not hurt the souls of those who are struggling with Satan's temptations. It will enter into the feelings of those who are tempted that the trials and temptations shall be so managed as to bring out the gold and consume the dross. This is the practice which God appoints to all. In this Christ school, all may learn their lessons daily, both teachers and pupils, to be patient, humble, generous, noble. You will all have to seek God most earnestly in prayer, mingled with living faith, and the molding hand of God will bring out his own image in your character. Temptations will come, but not overcome. But through grace found in opening the heart to the knock and voice of Jesus, Christian character and experience are growing more and more beautiful and heavenly. Let us bear in mind that we are dealing with souls that Christ has purchased with infinite cost to himself. Oh, tell the erring, God loves you. God died for you. Weep over them. Pray with them. Shed tears over them, but do not get angry with them. They are Christ's purchased possession. Let everyone seek a character that will express love in all his actions. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a milestone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. It were better not to live than to exist day by day devoid of that love which Christ has revealed in his character and has enjoined upon his children. Said Christ, love one another as I have loved you. Ye live in a hard, unfeeling, uncharitable world. Satan and his confederacy are plying every art to seduce the souls for whom Christ has given his precious life. Everyone who loves God in sincerity and truth will love the souls for whom Christ has died. If we wish to do good to souls, our success with these souls will be in proportion to their belief and our belief in and appreciation of them. Respect shown to the struggling human soul is the sure means through Christ Jesus of the restoration of the self-respect the man has lost. Our advancing ideas of what he may become is a help we cannot ourselves fully appreciate. We have need of the rich grace of God every hour. Then we will have a rich practical experience. For God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. Give love to them that need it most. The most unfortunate, those who have the most disagreeable temperaments need our love, our tenderness, our compassion. Those who try our patience need most love. We pass through the world only once. Any good thing we can do, we should do most earnestly, untiringly, with the same spirit as is stated of Christ in his work. He will not fail nor be discouraged. The rough, stubborn, sullen disposition are the ones who need help the most. How can they be helped? Only by that love practiced in dealing with them, which Christ revealed to fallen man. Treat them you may as they deserve. What if Christ had treated us thus? He, the undeserving, was treated as we deserve. Still, we are treated by Christ with grace and love as we did not deserve, but as he deserved. Treat some characters as you think they richly deserve, and you will cut off from them the last thread of hope. Spoil your influence and ruin the soul. Will it pay? No. I say no a hundred times no. Bind these souls who need all the help it is possible for you to give them close to a loving, sympathizing, pitying heart overflowing with Christ-like love and you will save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Had we not better try the love process? And that is a wonderful question question to ask of each of us. We need
need to try the love process. It doesn't mean we can't still tell them what we see in them, but we need to do it in a loving way. Listen, brother, I noticed that you're doing this and I just wanted to point out that I saw this and I would be happy to study this out with you and here are some quotes for you to look over and pray about and consider and I send this to you in love. But sometimes even when we are loving, people will come to you and they will be so mean and nasty in return. But that's okay because they don't have Christ in them yet and we must pray for these souls and we must respond in a kind and loving way. We must pray that the Lord gives us the wisdom to know what to say and how to respond because we are all guilty of this. We all want flesh to rule first. We all want to just fly off the handle and we get in our feelings and we get in our hurts and we miss apply and we assume what people mean and we just are too much in our thoughts and not okay Lord help me to respond in a kind loving way help me to be a good witness to you help me to help this person help me to have your love for them help me to show your love to them how would you have me respond how would you have me witness to this soul instead of getting angry and being upset we could do so much damage by responding in the wrong way and we must ask the Lord for forgiveness for doing this in the past because we have so much weakness and so much of this horrible selfish nature in us all of us is selfish and all of us have these horrible traits because we're all sinners and we all need Christ but it is not impossible the Lord gives us hope the Lord tells us if we go to him through prayer that he will not fail us he will help us to have that Christ like love we and to have these characteristics in our life and in our hearts we only have to be willing to go to him and pray 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 prayer is the most important thing a christian should be doing also that is our connection with god we need to not only study and pray but then we need to witness and we need to share with the world the message the lord has given us and we need to do it in that christ-like love that is why it is important and we need everything. We need the love, we need the truth, and we need to share it. And the Lord will be with us as we do it all. We can't have one without the other. If we just pray and study all the time, that we will dry up too. We have to share with others. And that's a whole other study, not for this time. But I just wanted to share these quotes because of how important it is and how much we need to work on ourselves and to work on this Christ-like character because without it, we will be lost. And I will be praying for all of you and I hope that you pray for me as we both go through this world together that we may be ready for his soon coming because with all of that is happening in the world time is running out and we don't have time to play any more games please keep your soul in prayer we need to have that constant communication with the lord pray without ceasing like paul said we need to be in the word we need to know the word and we need to share the word as i said time and time again now with all of this being said i wanted to sing this song called nothing between Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessing his face may be seen nothing preventing the least of his favor keep the way clear let nothing between nothing between like worldly pleasure habits of life though harmless they seem must not my heart from him ever Ever sever. He is my all, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, there's nothing between. Nothing between like pride or 
your station self for friend shall not intervene though it may cost me much tribulation i am resolved there's nothing between nothing between my soul and the savior so that his blessed face may be seen nothing preventing the least of his favor keep the way clear let nothing between nothing between and many hard trials though the whole world against me convene watching with prayer and much self-denial triumph at last there's nothing between nothing between my soul and the savior so that his blessed face may be seen nothing preventing the least of his favor keep the way clear there's nothing between and that's what we all need to want and hope for that we have nothing between us and Jesus so that we can be with him when it's triumph at last with nothing between us and that we can evermore be with him remember he is a God of love he does love us that's why he died for us that's why we should love him because he first loved us it says in Matthew 5 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven so with all of this being said let your light so shine so that you are a star witness for the Lord.